The Sign of the Beaver, Chapter 10 He felt weak with relief when next morning Atian walked stiffly into the cabin and sat down at the table. Stumbling over himself, he set about the lesson. As soon as he could, he picked up Robinson Crusoe. In the night, he had carefully thought out just what he was going to say, if Atian ever gave him another chance. Now, he had to talk fast, because he could see that Atian was set against hearing any more of this book. Let me go on, he pleaded. It's different from now on. Friday, that's what Robinson Crusoe named him, doesn't kneel anymore. Not slave? No, Matt lied. After that, they get to be, well, companions. They share everything together. Ignoring the suspicion in Atian's face, Matt began hurriedly to read. He was thankful that he knew the book so well that he was able to see when trouble might be coming. One of the first words Crusoe taught his man Friday was the word master. Luckily, he caught that one in time. And it was true, Crusoe and his new companion did go about together sharing their adventures. Only, Matt thought, it would have been better perhaps if Friday hadn't been quite so thick-headed. After all, there must have been a thing or two about that desert island that a native who had lived there all his life could have taught Robinson Crusoe. When Matt closed the book, Atian nodded. Then, as so many times before, he took Matt by surprise. You like go fish? he asked. I sure would, Matt said gratefully. Stopping to pick up his fish pole from beside the door, he ran to overtake the Indian boy, who strode ahead. He knew his grin was stretching from one ear to the other, but he couldn't hide his feelings as Atian did. They walked some distance, Matt managing to keep pace with the Indian's swift stride, determined not to let Atian know that his ankle was aching. They seemed to be following no particular trail. Finally, they came out on a part of the creek that Matt had not seen before. It was shallow here, studded with rocks and pebbles, so the water rippling over them made little rapids or collected in quiet pools. Here, Atian stopped, broke off a sapling, and instead of making a fish pole, drew his knife from his pouch and quickly shaved a sharp point, making a spear. Then he stepped gently into the stream. Matt stood watching. Atian stood motionless, peering intently into a pool of clear water. All at once, he stooped, darted his spear with one quick stroke, and came up with a glittering fish. He studied it for a moment. Too small, he decided. To Matt's astonishment, he spoke to the fish quite solemnly, a few incomprehensible words, then tossed it back into the stream. In a few moments, he had speared another, which he judged large enough to keep. Do same, he ordered now, coming back to the bank. He handed Matt the spear. He would just look ridiculous, Matt knew before he started. He waded in and stood up to his knees, looking down into the sliding water. Presently, a fish darted past. At least he thought it was a fish. It was hard to tell which was shadow and which might be a fish. At any rate, it was gone before he got his spear into the water. Presently, he saw another, this one quite definitely a fish, calmly drifting in the pool. He jabbed at it hopelessly. He was sure his stick actually touched the slippery thing. He lunged at it, lost his footing, and went down with a splash that would scare off any fish for miles around. When he came up dripping, he saw Atian watching him with a horrid grin. Suddenly he felt hot in spite of the icy water. Why had Atian brought him out here anyway? Had Atian just wanted to show off his own cleverness and to make Matt look more clumsy than ever? Was this Atian's answer? in case Matt had any idea in his head about being a Robinson Crusoe. For a moment, Matt glared back at Atian with a scowl as black as any Indian's. Then he wiped his nose with the back of his hand and sloshed back to the bank. He snatched up his own pole in line. He poked about under the wet leaves and found a good, juicy worm and fitted it to his hook. I'll do it my own way, he said. I can catch plenty of fish with this, and that's what matters. Atian sat on the bank and watched. To Matt's satisfaction, in no time, there was a tug on the line, a strong one. 
an impressive-looking fish rose to the surface, thrashing fiercely. Matt gave a jerk, and the line came swinging out of the water so suddenly that he almost lost his footing again. It was empty. Fish broke line, Atian observed, as if anyone couldn't see that. Furious at Atian, at the fish, and at himself, Matt examined the break. Unable to face the Indian, he had lost more than a good fish. His hook had disappeared as well. The only hook he had. Of course, Atian noticed. Those black eyes never missed anything. Make new hook, he suggested. Without even getting to his feet, he reached over and broke a twig off a maple sapling. Out came the crooked knife again. In a few strokes, he cut a piece as long as his little finger, carved a groove along the middle, and whittled both ends into sharp points. Now he stepped into the water and tied Matt's line expertly around the groove. Put on two worms, he said. Cover all hook. He didn't offer to find the worms. Matt had lost all interest in fishing. He knew that somehow or other he would just provide more amusement for a tea in but he couldn't refuse. He didn't have to wait long before another fish caught hold. This time, he landed it neatly. Good, said a tea in from the bank. Big. Matt was trying to get it off the line. He swallowed the whole hook, he said. Better white man's hook, a tea in said. Turn around inside fish, not get away. Back on the bank, Matt slit the fish and extracted the hook with his line. But the thin twig had broken in half. Easy make new hook, Atian said. Make many hooks. Of course, looking down at the simple thing in his hand, Matt realized that he never again need worry about losing a hook. He could make a new one wherever he happened to be. It was another necessary thing that Atian had shown him, just as he had made the snare. He wasn't sure why Atian had bothered, but grudgingly, he had to admit that Atian had proved to him once again that he didn't always have to depend on the white man's tools. All at once he was hungry. The sun was straight overhead, and it would be a long tramp back through the woods before he could cook his fish. Now he saw that Atian had the same thought. The Indian was heaping up a small pile of pine needles and grass. He drew from his muskrat skin pouch a piece of hard stone with bits of quartz embedded in it. Striking it with his knife, he soon had a spark which he blew into a flame. I could have done that myself, Matt thought. In fact, he had done it many times, but he had not realized that he could use a common stone as well as his flint. Get fish ready, Atian ordered now, pointing to the two fish on the bank. Matt did not like his masterful tone, but he did as he was told. By the time he had the two fish split and gutted and washed in the creek, Atian had a fire blazing. Matt was curious to see how he would go about the cooking. He watched as Atian cut two short branches, bending them first to make sure they were green. He trimmed and sharpened them rapidly. Then he thrust the pointy end into each fish from head to tail. A small green stick was set crosswise inside the fish to hold the sides apart. He handed one stick to Matt. One on each side of the fire, the two boys squatted and held their sticks in the blaze. From time to time, a tea and fed the fire with dry twigs. When the flesh was crisp and brown, they ate, still silently. Matt licked his fingers. His resentment had vanished along with his hunger. Golly, he said, that was the best fish I ever ate. Good, said a tea Across the fire, he looked at Matt, and his eyes gleamed. He was laughing again, but somehow not with scorn. What did you say to that fish you threw back? Matt was still curious. I say to him, not tell other fish, Atian said seriously. Not scare away. You actually think a fish could understand? Atian shrugged. Fish know many things, he replied. Matt sat pondering this strange idea. Well, it seemed to work, he said finally. At least the other fish came along. A wide grin spread slowly across Atian's face. It was the first time Matt had seen him smile. And we'll read chapter 11 next time. Meantime, until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.